What central theme runs through all the Bible? How would you respond, Jesus, the plan of salvation? The cross, yes to all three, of course, but these three important topics unfold against another all-encompassing theme. The great controversy, this theme pervades the Bible, from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, the great controversy began in heaven with Lucifer's rebellion against God. At the heart of this cosmic conflict is the issue of God's love. Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome back to Whispering Hope Daily Lesson Study Review here with us. We are studying this week the central issue, love or selfishness. And our topic for this morning, Wednesday morning, caring for the community. But before we go into our discussion, we'll have our prayer by Elder Richards and our memory text by Elder Josiah. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you once again for waking us up this We want to thank you for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. And Lord, as we discuss your words, we pray, Lord, that uh, the hearers and they'll be hearers and doers. Father, bless us and keep us. And may the Holy Spirit be with our words. And we pray, Lord, that these words will be something that will help someone to go close to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Our memory text is taken from Isaiah 41 and verse 10, which reads, Fear not. For I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. We're looking at our topic and subtopic context, as well as our memory text, main points and insights. We'll begin with Elder Joseph. The week's topic is the central issue, love or selfishness. And for today, we are looking at uh, caring for the community. Let's couple this together. Uh, the potent question is, can we divorce love from selfishness? Can we divorce love from selfishness? I read somewhere where somebody says, let love be the foundation of your actions. Love is universal. And we know agape love, which is God love, is what overrides all other love. Yes, people do love themselves and become selfish. So we see that another aspect of love. I love myself. And that is selfish love. But that's not the love that God wants us to have. We wanted to look at the love of John 3, 16, which encompasses God says that he so loved the world that he sent Jesus to die. And verse 7 says, because God does not wish that any should perish. So that's the kind of love we are looking at. And that's the central theme we want to see that would run through our discourse this morning, that God's love is encompasses everybody, leaves no one out. So hence, love cannot be selfish. Well, we're looking at that memory text in you know, Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, you know, um, putting it in context, we see a quick summary of God's love for mankind, you know, because it is a quick summary of God's redemptive plan, you know, or where he's going to bring the remnant back from Egypt to a promised land and eventually to bring the remnant for eternal life, you know, to heaven. And so we see uh, that this is a command and a promise. Uh, the command is fear not. You know, as long as we, we're with God, we have no need to, to fear. And so we see words of comfort and words of assurance and and then God's promises to, to bring his chosen back and to give them uh, eternal life. And and so this demonstrated, it demonstrated that God has not rejected us. It demonstrated his love and his grace and his mercy. And so the passage says, you know, fear not. You see, we sin because of fear. When we become afraid, sometimes we take things upon our ourselves and matters are in our hands and we try to do things and try to fix God's way. And so he's saying, you know, fear not. He says, be not dismayed, for I am your God. And what is so powerful about it, that God is saying that I am your God. And if, if we have to, to create something and make it a God, then we are more powerful than the thing we created. And so God is saying, I am the creator. I am your God. So be dismayed. I will always be with you. And, and, and so we know that if God is with us, who can be against us? And that is Romans 8.31. And then also in Romans 8.37, it says that we are more than conquerors in Christ. And then, then again in 2 Corinthians 9, chapter 12, verse 9 and 10, in summary, it says that when we are weak, then Christ is strong. And so we can rely on Christ's strength. And so most importantly, God is saying, I will be with you. 
in our eye was trending. And so we have to hold on to those words of promises and those words of comfort and most of all those words of hope. And that's what the memory text is telling us there, is that it says God will uphold us. He says not dismay. He will strengthen us with his, his righteous right hand. And so we have no need for fear, no need for worry. And that is hope, that is comfort, that is courage. And we can live our life knowing that we have a God who is all powerful, almighty, who is willing, ready, and able to be with us. Amen, amen. Well, uh, Nehemiah started out with saying if he can divorce love from uh, selfishness. And I would even take it a little step further, you know, say, can you divorce love from our Christian belief? You know, God himself, Jesus himself came. And we, we going, as we go into the lesson, <clears throat> we look at John 10, 10. Jesus says, I've come that they may have, you might have life and have it more abundantly. And John 16 also talks about the love of God, that he shed his blood for every human being. So the thing is now, the work that Jesus came to do, and if you look at even Luke chapter 4, verse 18, verse uh, 10, it says, you know, this is what I came to do because of the love that the Father has for you. This is what I came to do. So the thing is, our Christian belief, our Christian ideals, our Christian work, it can, it has to go hand in hand with love so you know the central issue for us is not to be selfish but to follow god's way of life the bible tells us god is love and if we cannot love the way god is teaching us to then our christian work is in vain and that's when when we talk about caring for our community we have to show that love for our community to respond to know that truly god is a god of love because we would exhibit that to them amen amen so we're gonna go right into our scripture we're gonna ask elder josiah to read for us acts 2 44 to 47 elder richards acts 3 6 to 9 and elder joseph acts 6 1 to 7 and then we'll come right back to our question acts chapter 2 verses 44 to 47 reads and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possession and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continued with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from one house, from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Amen. And reading from Acts chapter 3, 6 to 9, reading from the King James Version, it says, Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. I'm using the King James Version of the Bible, Acts chapter 6, 1 to 7. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians, against the Hebrew Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out amongst you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saint pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicolas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and the great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And our question here is, although circumstances vary, 
What principles can we learn from these passages about authentic Christianity? We begin with Elder Josiah. One of the first things that I see in these three passages, in terms of all the verses together, it talks, you know, gives unity when it comes to the Word of God. And as they receive the Word of God, they become united in their thinking. They become united in service. And they did not dismiss anyone. They make sure that everyone was taken care of. If you notice, the scripture says, as they believed, they had all things together common. And those who had things, had riches, you know, had something so that, you know, life can be easier for them. And that's one of the, the greatest lessons for us today as Christians, as we walk with Christ. In this world, we see chaotic movements among the people. And sometimes because of these chaotic moments, we do not want to venture into certain places. We do not want to venture to do certain things because we think, oh, this is going to affect us. This is going but these people are showing us the example in the Bible that these are the things that we're supposed to be doing in terms of caring for one another. That's and when we talk about love earlier, this is what love is all about. Caring for each other, you know, as God gives us wisdom. It, it motivates us to do the things of God. And as, you know, Peter was saying, look, I, I do not have anything, but I can give you God's love. And by doing that, you see life changes. When we look at Acts chapter 6, we see that not just unity, not just caring for the community, but the thing is, it drives the people to organize that you do this, you do this, you do this. Everybody did not just say, oh, I'm going to preach the word of God. But there are certain things that some people had to do. So the thing is, God is not unorganized all over the place when it comes to the, giving the gospel to people. He's, you know, God makes the people become organized in spreading the gospel and doing it in a proper way. And that's, that's a lesson for us. These are the things that we are, to, we are supposed to visualize and follow. And when we do that, we will see differences in our community today as was in the church of old. Well, you know, God is love. Not God is loving, but God is love. And so because of his love, he's motivated by his love to, to do the acts of love. And so when Christ came to this earth, you know, Christ died because he loved the world and which we love humanity. And, and so we see in these passages of scripture, even though the occasions might be different, and the scenarios may be different. You know, they had, as Elder Josiah said, they had one interest. They were unified to reveal the likeness and, and Christ's character, which is love and, and how they care for one another. You know, they were also willing to labor to build up God's kingdom. They were preaching, they were serving, they were healing and in the name of Christ. But most importantly, I think that we can't forget this. This was a time just after Pentecost. And so they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. And, and so we see every occasion that the Holy Spirit empower, uh, you know, human beings to, to do the will of God and to help others. And so, you know, they were loving, you know, they were caring, they were, they were caring for hurting people. You know, people in the community restoring humanity physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And, and so what we saw in this three passage of scripture, we see that, you know, the, the saints of God, and at that time, just after Pentecost, they were sharing the same Lord Jesus Christ. That's what they were doing. You know, they were, they were, they were guided by the Holy Spirit. They share the same love of God. You know, among each other and to the community. You know, they, they share the same desire to, to work and to help others to, to, to gain eternal life by getting to Jesus. Yes, they all had the same struggles. They had to eat, they had to sleep. I'm sure they had family issues, you know, so they and and but they also share the same victory, you know, over the sin. And so you know, their job was to spread the gospel, to care for the community, and to share God's love. love. And so what we see, the, the most, I think one of the most important things that we can't forget, though, about this whole passage of Scripture is that they were all moved by the Holy Spirit to do God's will. And so because of that act, as we continue to look at the passage of Scripture, because of that act, because of how they were living like Christ, caring for one another, 
then that's when the name Christian was attached to them, saying that they are Christ-like. And so I think that is one of, that is one of the most common goals that we can look at, uh, common principles, is that they were moved by the Holy Spirit, motivated by love, to care for everyone in the community. Okay, our topic this morning is caring for the community. Caring for the community. And as the two elders have said, it was after Pentecost, yes, the power of God was moving like a magnet in the, in the area. But among the believers, there were some, as we see the trend that comes through there, that there were still things happening that was causing people to grumble, as it is today. People are looking for positions. But what I find as I go through these scriptures is that I find that a thread of compromise was seen where the people were working together for the common good of everybody. Now, Jesus compromised his position in heaven. What did he do? He took off his, his royal robe. He came down in flesh and blood to this earth to suffer and die for the sins of mankind so that we can be reconciled to him and the father right he didn't have to do that christ did not have to take off his royal robe he was the bible says he was made lower than the angels he came down he was he came down in flesh and blood that's a compromise so i, I see compromise i see compromise in here and it brings me also to that chapter in luke chapter 10 when a, one of the lawyers tried to justify himself and tell ask jesus then who is my neighbor remember christ said love the lord with all your heart body mind and soul and the second is like unto the first love your neighbor as yourself and we know the story of the good samaritan the good samaritan who when he was on his way remember the priests and the levites all these people people passed by you can read it in acts chapter 10 but the samaritan who should not even be there or do anything to anybody he compromised his position. He went across and he took up the man, put the man on his donkey, took him to the inn, pay all that he had to pay, took care of him. That was out of his fear. As far as they were looking at, he had no right to do that. But because he was serving in the community and recognized that anyone in the community who is being hurt, he needs to be taken care of. He needs to be taken care of. When we look at the first reading, we realized that the people there, they had all the different craft. Remember some have books with their whisk craft and all the things they were doing. What did they do with all those books that cost all those thousands of dollars? It says that they burned their books and they sold all what they have and they brought it to the community and they served, they broke bread, they do what they have to do, sharing with each and every one. And so for us as Seventh-day Adventists today, the Bible tells us we must not be afraid of man's faces. We have been commissioned to go in all the world and preach the gospel. And hence, as we go, we should not compromise our position with the gospel. But what we do, we compromise in a way that is good. We have good and bad comp comp compromising. We are compromising because we're going out there. We are using our resources. We're not hurting and be selfish and taking things for ourselves and thinking it's grand enough. What I have is mine and I'm not going to share it with anybody else. No. That's not what God wants us to do. He say, go in there for teach and preach and our resources, our monies. We might have to tap into our savings if it's possible. And if you got to do that, we are doing it for God because God says, do not store up your goods here on earth where mud will rust and people come in and thieve, but store it up in heaven. And the good deeds that we do here on earth, we are storing up good, our treasures in heaven because we are helping humanity to focus them to God Almighty, who is the savior of mankind. That's what it's all about. So yes, yes, it is a good thing that we recognize where the ills of society are being broken down, that we as Christians, and especially, I, I, I want, to, want to say that, as Seventh-day Adventists should see the need to get up, do not relax on our laurels and sit in the church. We should get up and go out and do evangelistic work because in a time like this, when we see all these ills, we are to, to, to be promoting the gospel, the three angels' messages, not no soft messages in the church, the three angels' messages that is calling men back to true worship so that God, God can come back and take us to be with him. That's what we're waiting for. We don't want to do it by ourselves. We are not selfish. We want others also to enjoy the bliss 
of eternal life. Amen, amen. So, Elder Josiah, this question is for you. It asks us to read John 10, verse 10, and it says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. The question here is, what in this verse helps to reveal that he, being God, cares for the community? I look at this, and, and you know, for me, I always go back to the origin. If you notice all the lessons that we have gone through, I've gone back to Genesis to show something. But if we notice carefully, in this passage of Scripture, it says, the thief has come to, to steal and to destroy, kill and destroy, but I came, which means Jesus, what he was saying, I was at a distance. And we, if you look at John 1, 1 to 14, which, which states that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and, you know, the Word came and lived among us, became flesh and lived among us. You know, when we go back to Genesis, and it says, let us create man in our image, in our own likeness. I know Jesus is saying, I have come. So which means he's not at a distance when he comes to us. He created us. And when he created us, and even when sin came in and messed us up, he says, you know what? I'm going to come amongst you. I'm going to smell like you. I'm going to make sure I look like you just to show the love that I have for you. I saw a demonstration the other day, last Sabbath in church, where uh, this chemist was, you know, had this liquid and he poured uh, color into a clear liquid and saying, that's when sin enters. Then he poured another liquid and everything becomes clear again. And that's to show, he says, Jesus took all that sin for us. And then when that liquid become clear, he says, you know what? that he take his blood and cleanse us that's love john 3 16. so when we talk about you know jesus caring for the community he made us in his own image we messed up we give our allegiance to satan and he bought us with his blood redeemed us so that we can be in that likeness and image of christ once more not just that we look at luke chapter 4 and verse 10 jesus was describing why i came and he says this is fulfilled and we can also tie that in with john john 5 39 this is why he came so that he can show us that he loves us amen amen so our final question for this morning what does the church what role does the church have in operating with Christ in proving Satan's charges wrong? What role does the church have in cooperating with Christ in proving Satan's charges wrong? We'll begin with Elder Richards and Elder Joseph and then Elder Josiah will wrap up for us. I, I think we'll tie these two questions, question that you just asked Elder Josiah along with this question. You know, when, when Christ says that the thief cometh to kill and destroy, you know, sometimes many individuals have tied that passage of scripture into financial gain or acquisition of things. And, and that, that's not what the scripture is talking about. You know, scripture, Jesus was saying that the thief cometh to destroy life, but I came to give life. And, and so likewise in the community, you know, you know, we are responsible, first and foremost, the church is responsible in the community to exalt God, to lift God up. And secondly, the, the saints uh, commission to, to evangelize, to evangelize this world and the community. And so how do we do this? We do this by the way in which we care for each other. We do this by how we spread the gospel of God, the gospel of love. You know, that, that redemptive power of Jesus Christ, knowing that giving hope, to a lost world, knowing that Jesus is soon to return. And, and so there is hope. And so how do we care for the community? We care for the community by how we, how we live for each other, loving one another, sharing Christ, sharing the message, the good news of salvation. And, and the good news of salvation is, is to give that knowledge, you know, of that message you know, to lost souls, people who have messed up. And so we must help to develop Christ-like attributes, and in transforming the, the, our community, our society, so that we can, in this world, we can live 
better love one another and have peace you know with one another and i, and I think that's the whole aspect so when christ was explaining john that i came to give life it's not about the acquisition of things but it's more about uh, for us to live our life for christ so that we may be able to be obedient to god's word his ten commandments and have the testimony of jesus christ and so in that the life giver who is jesus christ we were able to 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 redeem us to his own satan on the other hand now he came to destroy to tempt us so that we may sin you know and when we sin you know that's because the wages of sin is death and so if he come tempting us so that we may sin obviously he wants us to die and so that's what christ was trying to explain so in the community we because of love and motivated by love we don't want to see others lost and lose our salvation and so what do we do we need to spread god's word that message of salvation a message of love and message of hope so that others to may able to to gain eternal life through jesus christ when he comes a second time this is how i see the church today because the question is about the church hear what the songwriter says heart is the shepherd's voice i hear out in the desert dark and drear calling the sheep who's gone astray far from the shepherds fall away bring them in bring them in bring them in from the fields of sin bring them in bring them in bring the wanderers to jesus this is the church's work my beloved the church is a hospital for sinners listen to what the scripture says as we have read this morning it tells us clearly that all these people were added to the church why because the church was proclaiming the gospel of jesus christ in their communities now it is not that we are only preaching the gospel to those who are in the church it is to the sinners the sinners in the church also hear what the good news is that if you're a lesbian or you are gay or you're a thief you're a murderer you are whatever you are whatever sin you have committed how bad you are christ is there for you and he asks the community of believers who is the church right to bring everybody in it is not that as you come in that we are going to throw you in front of the church no we're not going to do that because you have to go there is milk and there is hard food so there is going to be growth Paul himself is right. We know right in the Corinthian church. He told them, look, many of you were like this. You were thieves, you were, you were lesbians and gays. I'm paraphrasing, he says that. And you were this and you were that. But he says, sub so some of you. But no, you have been washed. You have been cleansed. You have been bought with the blood of Christ. So that's what the church needs to do, to get up and go out and preach and teach. And when people come in, we do not look at them with some long iron, some bad iron, and fail to embrace them. We embrace everybody as a church. Everybody. When you go out to do evangelistic work in the community, you don't pick and choose unless you are not barred by the language barriers. Once you can speak to somebody, you speak to them. Tell them about the love of Christ. Don't be afraid of them. And that's what the church is there for, to communicate to the people not only to those who are on the street but those who are in offices too the governors the presidents the prime ministers they too need to know about jesus because you know we had an earthquake up here in the states just a few days ago there and i and there were so much people who was frightened and was scared and calling up pastors calling up people saying man i was so scared i need to get my i need to get my life together just for a little earth trauma right and there's so much conspiracies going on now with the eclipse that is coming up people say now can the things are going to happen locusts are going to come from the earth they say and begin to attack men people are worried they are scared they don't know the gospel so the church is here to teach the gospel with love compromising where we can but not compromising the word that means compromise what you got to do your money your time your talent and do what you have to do so that the word of god can be preached in all the world and jesus would come
I think I'll make it brief. I think Matthew 28, 20 sums it up of what the church should do. We call it the Great Commission in terms of going out, preach, teach, baptize in the name of Christ. You know, we, we look at the Ten Commandments as the character, the character of God. This is a command from Jesus to show what the character of God is through Christians. That's the way that we should live our lives. When we go preach, teach, and baptize, it show it should show that we are a caring community to show what the character of God is all about. So as we go along our, in our Christian walk, with the church, the church's duty, as Elder Richard said, is to exhort God, to, to lift up God, to show that God, our creator, cares. Even when we lost hope in ourselves, God does lo lose hope in us. I share with us what your takeaway from our lesson is this morning. And also, since it's your first lesson with us for the quarter, you're going to tell us what you're, what you're expecting from our lesson as we proceed, as we study the Great Controversy. My takeaway, I, I want to leave with um, John 10.10. 10. And I think that's very important for us to understand that, you know, when Christ was speaking, he says, the thief does come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they might be have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And, and my takeaway is that, and I just want to leave with, you know, the, the listening audience, is that God is saying to us, Christ is saying to us, listen, Satan has come to destroy you. Point blank. There is no love in Satan's action. But I, Christ, have come so that you may have life and live it more abundantly. And what Christ was speaking here about eternal salvation, we have this hope that should be burning within us, hoping in the coming of Jesus Christ. And I just want to leave with saints and then for those who are listening, that that hope, without that hope, we die. Without living for Christ, we die. But if we want to live life abundantly, choose Jesus and live. My expectation for this quarter, as we look at the great controversy, last week's lesson talks about that war beginning in heaven. It started in heaven. And sometimes we may ask, have the question, many have had this question, how can a perfect being sin? How come good things, good people, bad things happen to good people? But some people may ask the question, where was God when this happened? And how could God permit certain things to happen? One of the things that we must remember is that without choices, there is no love. If you are forced to do something, that's not love. And so God has created us good beings, perfect beings, but he also gives us choice and we can choose to do things. And so God has to allow us to make choices. Everyone choice has consequence. And we'll see in this great con controversy, I will open trust that we will see the love of God and, and how he restrained the devil from doing much more than he could have done. But, it, but finally and eternally, that we will see the destruction, the plan of Satan, that the devil will be destroyed. Hell was, it will not be created for, for humankind. It was created for the devil. But he doesn't want to go there alone. He wants to take someone with him. And so I'm hoping and trusting that we will be able to explain and to, to let this world see that this battle is between God and Satan. But Satan is trying to bring us into that so that we can be destroyed. And God's love is about saving us so that we may have eternal life and live upon it. Again. And I'm hoping and trusting that others will be able to see this controversy that is going on, that we are not fighting against flesh and blood. Was about, but about against principalities and wickedness in high places. And God is on our side. And if we choose God, we will live with him in eternity, forever and ever. Amen. My takeaway is this, that I want the listening audience and even us as members to understand that God has a church. And this church is a body of believers who is preaching a message 
of salvation a true message of salvation and that true message is incumbent with the word of god the spirit of god the way of god where he says that go ye therefore and teach preach this gospel is the gospel of truth the gospel where points out that god's commands his commandments are not abrogated they are secured for our best interest and how we are to live to please that god whose character is seen in these ten commandments all right and once we follow that we as a body of believers are to embrace all who comes into our sphere of influence all those who make a decision to join this body of believers that we treat them right no matter how they come how they what they look like how whatever extremities they're coming from we are to embrace and love them and what i want this quarter to bring out is the unmasking of satan that at the end of the study that satan would be unmasked we will understand what satan's agenda is and move away from it that this study will make it so plain to all those who are listening and watching and searching not only listening and take but after they take their notes they would have go back and do their research and recognize that satan is a liar he's a defeated foe and he's doing all kind of things the bible says that he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he devour let it not be after our study and we have a mark who satan is that you remain in doubt and fear satan is defeated it's already satan is already the, the fact that he was kicked out of heaven he has already been defeated so let us continue to just unmask him and at the end of this quarter i want that to be the case that everybody understand who satan is and who jesus really is amen amen my takeaways from acts chapter 10 and verse 38 which states that you know everywhere that jesus went he was doing good and he was doing good Oh, he says God was with him. So for us and, and the church is to go about doing good as Jesus did because we are following his example. And my expectation for this quarter is that as we've read in the early passages in Acts chapter 2 and, and so on, is that when our listeners receive this message, that they become as the people in that time and become and everybody becomes one in terms of understanding and that when god shines light in their heart many will receive the message of god and come to join his kingdom amen amen and that has brought us to the end of our discussion this morning we are glad that you could have joined us as we studied and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning when our topic will be a legacy of love. So share the link with the family, share the link with a friend, and join us as we continue to study together.